lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike Podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I am here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? Doing pretty good. How are you? Cold. Cold. It's cold. <laughs> we did uh, we did lose a few degrees after that storm last night. Yeah. Yeah, that, luckily that storm wasn't too bad. It was actually. I know, like it was. There was a bunch of hype. <laughs> yeah, they they definitely built it up to be like a once in a lifetime kind of storm. Like, oh, there's yeah. going to be tornadoes everywhere. I I got to work today and I asked people around me. I was like, well, did our our terrible storm uh, was it as much of a non-event at your house as it was at mine? Because I got some lightning flashes and rain, and yeah. like that was it. That was all we got too. Yeah. Well, and because when I was leaving work yesterday, I was like, "Y'all be careful going home tonight, and be safe." And yeah, blah, blah, we blah. bailed out of the office early yesterday Did to make really? sure that everybody could get home before wow. it got really bad. I, well, and one of our guys um, lives in Mobile, and he left early for something else anyway yeah. and called the office and he was like man it is bad out here so oh wow yeah hmm. um so then we all we all kind of bailed like okay <laughs> yeah, well no. i mean i only live three miles away but i'd rather not do it in a monsoon right <laughs> yeah i i can work from home easily enough and actually truth is that i didn't leave at a time that's really much different than i usually leave yeah. because because you could have you could usually leave early <laughs> yeah because i usually leave early because I get home and I keep working. Yeah. Um, but especially this time of year, I, you know, I like to get home before it gets dark. Yeah. And so, um, I get that, you know, but, uh, the truth is that I, like I continue checking stuff to make sure everything's up to date, like pretty much until I go to bed. So, yeah. um, so, I don't, so they're benefiting. I, yeah. <laughs> I don't feel bad about, you know, leaving a half hour early and then yeah. coming home and continuing to work. So <laughs> yeah, it's okay. I think yeah. it's okay. I don't feel like I'm taking advantage. Well, I'm glad I wasn't the only one that over that was over worried about the storm. No, no, I just I don't know. In my in my business too, like storms get hyped anyway. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I feel like we uh, this is that wasn't much of a transition. I know <laughs> this is um, gonna be a non sequitur. <laughs> yeah, um, I feel like we kind of need to revisit the Griner stuff. Okay. Um, because we talked about that like the news had only come out like a couple of hours before yeah. we, it, we it came out recorded. that same day. Yeah. And I don't want to change our, my position. I don't know if you feel like, I, I think that I feel good about what I said. <laughs> yeah. I, I think that as far as the, the, the way we approached it, I think it's right. Um, but now I've seen how other media is reacting to this and yeah. I kind of want to, I don't know if I, I'm going to say it, if it's right to say that I want to address some of these things, but maybe more that I need to, I feel like I need to reiterate what we talked about. Okay. Um, to some degree and, you know, explain maybe a little better why, uh, why you, we feel the way we yeah, do. Cause why, I mean, I think we, we were in the same place yeah, pretty, for the most part. Why we approve of this. Yeah. Um, now one of the things that, that came out is that, um, I think I think I want to say it was NBC, but uh, somebody said that the um, that Biden was given a choice yeah. uh, between um, Whelan and Griner, and that he chose Griner. That's and then the White House denied it, and then the story was taken down. Yeah. Um, and I know that there's a lot of people that think, oh, you know he was given this choice and because of the LGBTQ thing or whatever, I don't know, whatever reason they attribute to this, um, that he chose Griner. Now there's a couple of things about that. First off, I'm going to say right now that I don't think a choice was given. No, that Um, I mean, and because the initial reports that I heard, because I've heard since the day of day, it was, um, happened, I've heard a lot of uh, some reports like what you're saying where it was like, well, they, he just chose the wrong one and like there was an option. But the coverage the day of mm-hmm. was pretty unanimous that like this was the option, take it or leave it. Um, yeah. But I have heard some stuff since then that were a little more hazy on that. But mm-hmm. I tend to to lean more towards at least the reporting I've seen, yeah. that that seems to be the case. The reliable sources that I get stuff from seem to indicate that, like he was, he didn't have a choice. It was this was the deal, take mm-hmm. it or leave it. Yeah, um, I I think that that's likely. Now, what I will say is that if he was given a choice, yeah, that the fact that they chose 
the civilian over the former military guy. And I think probably an asset, but maybe not. Um, I mean, I think chances are this guy actually is a spy. Oh, talking about the Whelan. Whelan. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, but th- the idea that the U S government would choose the civilian over the military guy, yeah. um, to me is really encouraging yeah. out of character for the U S government, I would say. <laughs> yeah. And that's why I think that that's evidence yeah. that he wasn't given a choice because I think if a choice had been given, yeah, they would have taken their guy yeah. over Griner. I would, I would tend to agree with that. Um, now, a- another thing that I have heard is that, well, because we're making a deal and again, I say, I'm glad that we made the deal and yeah. that I look forward to future deals. Yeah. Like let's start trading prisoners one for one. I, in whatever order they choose, I don't care. Yeah. I think that this is a great start. Yeah. Um, but that it encourages hostile countries to imprison Americans so yeah. that, you know, so that we'll make agreements with them to get those Americans back. Yeah. I've heard this argument. It's nice to have a few bargaining chips. If you're one of these countries that don't have a good relation with the U S yeah. Like, that's um, the argument. Yeah. Now, of course, my response to that should be obvious to everybody that stops and thinks about it for a moment, which is, yeah, this is a reciprocal issue. Yeah. So it also encourages the U S to capture Start. hostile, <laughs> you know, or pe- citizens from, quote unquote, hostile nations. Um, And the idea that the uh, U.S. government is above that is ridiculous. Remember that the U.S. has the highest prison population in the world. (laughs) I was fixing to say we got we got a lot of folks in jail on this side of the water. (laughs) Yeah. The U.S. government is not ashamed of taking prisoners. Yeah. Like they're more than happy to do so. So um, I think that if it encourages uh, hostile nations to um, imprison Americans it doesn't do that any more than it encourages the United States to imprison uh, so, uh, citizens from hostile nations. Yeah, yeah. So uh, this is a wash as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. I'm actually more concerned about the individual part, um, which is that I think that it also encourages Americans to ignore laws in nations where they're traveling. Yeah. Um, that this is actually far more of a concern to me. And I would suggest as an American, don't be that American, like have some respect for the laws of the nation where you are. Yeah. Um, but I think that it, it can encourage or incentivize Americans to ignore laws in other nations where they are because they think that the U S government will just come bail them out if they get in trouble anyway. Yeah. Even if it's in Qatar where they have some very crazy laws. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, who knows? But well, I mean, I, I'm a big believer in that. I mean, if, um, what is the saying? When in Greek, do as the Greeks do? Or it's when in Rome. When in Rome, do as the Romans. Like, yeah. I'm a big believer in that. Like, I um, I may not agree with, with the laws of some of these other countries, but mm-hmm. when you're there, like, you're yeah. kind of at their mercy. You're there as a guest is the way I look at it. Exactly. Have some respect. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, uh, I fi- finally, I think, just to sum up um, why this podcast, at least, um, is happy about this trade is that at the end of the day, last Thursday, uh, at the end of the day, two people at least were freer than they were at the beginning of the day. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And that is what this podcast is about. Absolutely. I mean, that, that is really the goal is to, you know, freedom in our lifetime, you know, uh, to everybody being freer. And so, Um, our position is what it is because at the end of the day, there were two people that were more free than they were when they started the day. And that can't be anything but positive. Yeah, no, I I absolutely agree. That's a well put. Um, so that's all I had on that. I just wanted to address some of the things like some of the responses and so forth. So, yeah, they're like I say, they're just like you, like I just even talking to just people out in the world, you know, mm. um, a lot of people disagree with this decision, especially particularly down south where we're at, apparently, yeah. because like I, I had to defend that position quite a bit this week. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, and I stand by it. Like I haven't changed my mind. I, that's why I was curious to hear what you had to say just now, because mm-hmm. I was curious if anybody had swayed you over no, the week. No, yeah. definitely not. Um, I, I think think that it's the it's the moral yeah it, it's morally correct absolutely no i'm so, with you um 
Now, another thing that I, I came across over the last week yeah. uh, was I was in a retail store and there was a line of people for a checkout and there was only one person at the checkout. I mean, it's a small store anyway. There's only two registers, I think. Yeah. Um, but there was only one person checkout and there was like five people lined up. And so I got into the back of the line and I'm looking at it and then I was like, oh, wait, they have a self-checkout option. Yeah. So I went to it. Yeah. And I checked myself out in about 15 seconds and bagged up my stuff and was on my way out. And as I was on my way out, uh, somebody asked the uh, older gentleman in front of me, like even older than me, <laughs> oh, <yeah>. um, <laughs> the older gentleman in front of me, if he needed help with the self-checkout. Yeah. And he said, oh, no, I never use those things. All they do is take people's jobs away. Yeah. Now, I was tempted. <laughs> <laughs> to give an economics lesson? <laughs> yes. <laughs> But I, I chose not to, and, you know, and I had everybody, like, giving me terrible stares at that moment anyway, because I was taking people's because jobs you're, away, you're, right? Because you're now the guy, right? <laughs> exactly. You're the villain in this story. And so, but other people in this line are agreeing with them. Yeah, oh, yeah, I feel the same way. And I was like, ah, eh, never mind. And so, I, I do have a question about the scenario, just real quick. Yeah. So, when... um. Somebody when was that a second employee that asked if they needed help with the no 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 it was another customer in the line oh okay okay yeah. I was just curious yeah it was yeah. I mean I guess the assumption was he was so old that maybe he didn't know how to use the thing yeah, yeah. Um, but he would like to <laughs> yeah which clearly he did not want to <laughs> but he, yeah that was not the case yeah um, okay so but I thought you know just in case any of these people are listening to our podcast yeah <laughs> we can provide an explanation about why that's wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I, I find, you know, you hear this a lot, um, that, you know, advancements in technology that reduce the number of people that it takes to do a job. Yeah. To produce the same amount. Yeah. Um, take people's jobs away. Yeah. And in an immediate sense that, that, that is, there's truth in it. Yeah. Um, like, when you went from the loom to the, uh, what do you call the automated, the sewing machine? Sewing machine, yeah. Um, there were a lot less people doing that work. <laughs> yeah. Um, but what it does is it frees people up. It frees up labor to do more productive things. Yeah. And uh, in the end, it actually increases the productivity of the society as a whole and therefore increases the wealth generated by that society so yeah. we all get richer in this scenario yeah. because you don't need three people checking out um people at a retail store yeah. you only need one person checking out people at a retail store and then everybody else can use the the self-checkout machine and you've got two extra people now that can do other things to produce goods for our society yeah where they're needed yeah oh absolutely and the whole the the Another just way of thinking about this as far as this, they're stealing our jobs idea is just, just understand that we're in an economy right now where there are more jobs than there are people that well, are willing to than, do those yeah, jobs. Well, that's, and that's what I mean. More, mm -hmm. yeah, there, these jobs are plentiful, like yeah. and retail establishments and, and entertainment establishments. All of these places are struggling right now because they can't mm -hmm. find people to do the jobs. So yeah. you boycotting the self checkout ain't exactly making a big stink here because the, the people you're trying to protect don't want these jobs anyway. Yeah. And it wastes everybody's time. Yeah. I could have stood in that line yeah. for seven minutes waiting for my turn to get checked out. Yeah. Or I could have saved myself six and a half minutes by checking out myself and leaving. Yeah. And th by the way, this is coming from somebody who hates self checkouts. I absolutely yeah. can't stand them. Like I, it just, it literally makes me like cringe thinking of like walking up and scanning my own stuff. Like I really have a problem with it, but I understand the economics behind it. Like the, that's my, my dislike for a self checkout has nothing to do with stealing somebody's job. Yeah. It has to do with just, I don't like doing it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, if you want, uh, more jobs to be out there, if you want to, in, this is going to sound so counterintuitive, but if you want to improve the lot of laborers uh, throughout, then what you got to do is that you actually have to roll back the legislation that makes it hard to hire people Yeah, and to keep people employed. And the, the tax that you put on employing, yeah, because that's what a, a lot of this legislation does. Requiring um, 
medical benefits, requiring all this stuff. I'm, it's not to say that people don't want them. And I, I understand the desire for this, but these used to be offered as perks to draw people to jobs. Yeah. And you could still get them without a job. Yeah. And in fact, when before I was employed and before like healthcare was a part of employment, essentially. Yeah. My healthcare was cheaper. Yeah. Everybody's was. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you haven't improved the situation by requiring uh, employers to offer health care. What you've done is you've reduced the labor market Yeah. Um, by all these taxes that you pay on, uh, on employees, uh, all the various things, all the extra costs that are applied to um, your employees for an employer yeah. make it less likely that they'll hire people. Yeah. It's essentially a tax on employment. And so the obvious result of if you raise the price of employment, you reduce the amount of employment. Yeah. And yeah. so if you really want to improve the lot for workers in America, you want to get rid of all these requirements. And that includes um, minimum wage. That's a big one. And it, it actually, like, if you don't like the self-checkout, machines then you should want to abolish minimum wage because paying somebody fifteen dollars an hour yeah or even twelve or whatever whatever it is to yeah. to produce eight dollars worth of, of work an hour yeah means that they're going to be replaced by something less yeah. that costs less oh absolutely like if you make an employee cost more than what they're producing then they're going to find an alternative yeah. and that's what this represents yeah um i mean and it may happen over time anyway just because it's efficiencies a, yeah yeah um well and the and the cost of the technology is dropping mm -hmm. um and that's a big that's actually a big part of the reason you're seeing more and more self-checkouts is because the it's just gotten to a point where that technology just isn't that expensive anymore there was a time when those machines costed a lot of money yeah and they really just don't anymore yeah so comparatively you know mm -hmm. compared to paying for health insurance for an employee exactly yeah. oh absolutely um, and so, uh, you're, you're just eliminating, you're, you're eliminating jobs by not, <laughs> yeah. um, by not using these things really. Like yeah. those jobs are going away one way or another. Yeah. Um, you're just, you're just wasting time. Oh, don't tell me I'm going to have to scan my own stuff at the grocery store. <laughs> I don't want to hear that. Well, I mean, I, I think that there's going to be easier ways um, yeah. to do it that you'll just like take a picture of everything you pick up with your phone and oh, I definitely don't want to do that. I mean, <laughs> that sounds worse. Yeah, it does. Doesn't it? What if you want to put something back? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> like I've changed my mind about this, this bunch of bananas. Yeah. I don't want them anymore. I want the technology where I just pick up the stuff I want and then walk out the door with it. And then it just taps my card for what I got. Well, we might be getting there too. I mean, they, they actually, was it, Ah, uh, one of these companies, it may have been Amazon, was experimenting mm -hmm. with exactly that technology. Yeah. You, if, I guess, if you had like a Prime account or whatever, mm -hmm. like they, there's the store. I forget where it's at. I thought you were telling me about. Oh, yeah, it's like one of the food stores that they took over or something. Yeah. Um, where you just uh, like it, it scanned your items as you walked out the door, yeah. more or less, and yeah. did Apple Pay or something. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly what it was. Um, yeah. And it was somebody. I, I thought it was you actually, but it might not have been talking to me about like. Uh, Circle K or somewhere where you just like lay your stuff out on the counter and the yeah. camera totals it, takes it all up. For yeah, it takes it. What? Well, yeah, it takes a picture of each item and charges it for you. It's a pretty neat idea, actually. Yeah. yeah. Um. So, uh, you know, the guy standing there behind the counter running all your items over the thing, like that's going away one way or another. Oh, it's yeah, it's it's yeah. The technology's just moving that direction. Yeah. Um. And if you want those people to still have jobs then you need to abolish minimum wage so that they can take those jobs for $2 an hour or something instead. <laughs> yeah. um, now, like that sounds bad, but the truth is that the price of everything would drop. Well, not only that is uh, something because I labor I, costs are huge. Well, and so, something people forget when you have this conversation is like, oh, well, that's just horrible if you're going to pay somebody $5 an hour to do work and blah, blah, blah. But the truth is, like some work, that's all it's worth. And for a lot of people, that can be a stepping stone. Mm -hmm. Like that's that's their foot in the door to a better job. Yeah. And that's all that's all a minimum wage job should ever be anyway. This whole idea that people are starving working off minimum wage, mm -hmm. well, that's 
kind of the idea. Like the idea isn't to be walking to a, a company and just start making all this money. Yeah. You have to work your way up. Mm -hmm. And a minimum wage should be entry level positions yeah. that move towards something more. And if you're not interested in doing something more, you need to find something you like and go do it. Like, I mean, if, if you're working at McDonald's going to make a career out of it, then you mm -hmm. need to make a career out of it. Yeah, because they show up on They time. have positions at McDonald's that are career positions, yeah. but they're not minimum wage jobs. They're yeah. not the entry level positions. Well, and I know that you can tell people that you can start with those minimum wage jobs. Yeah. And really in that kind of business, all you need to do is show up every day on time. Yeah, yeah. And do what you're asked. Yeah. Like, it's not <laughs> rocket science. Like, yeah. and nothing in the, any of these jobs are difficult. Like, I work in retail. There's nothing difficult in retail. Mm -hmm. No, it's a lot, mm -hmm. but it's nothing hard. Yeah. Um, and if you're just willing to put in the work, you can, you can make a decent living, but you're not going to walk in the door doing that. Yeah. It's just not the reality. Mm -hmm. And it shouldn't be the reality. Like that would it wouldn't make sense if that was the reality. Yeah. I mean, you started with an entry level position. Absolutely. In your business, right? Yeah. Absolutely. And work my way to where I'm at now. Yeah. Like and, and people too can do it. And I help people do it all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, but you gotta want to. Yeah. Well, and the, you got to remember the supply and demand aspect of this anyway. Like I said, if you raise the cost of labor, you're going to reduce the amount of demand for labor. Yeah. Um, if you lower the cost for labor, you're going to increase the amount of demand for labor. But you got the supply side too. Yeah. So if you increase the amount of demand for labor past a certain point, then in order to, to increase the supply, yeah. they have to increase the price. Yeah. <laughs> right. So if you're if the complaint is, well, you know, people can't live off two dollars an hour. Like I get that. All right. But the the point that we're trying to make here in in a theoretical sense, and this does work in the real world, by the way. But <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, it just takes time to yeah. transition. But in the theoretical sense, um, if you reduce the, the cost of labor by a, a significant amount, yeah. then it increases the demand for labor by quite a bit, too. And the demand can then outstrip the supply. And when the demand outstrips the supply, the only way that the employer has to increase the supply of labor is by offering more money for it. Which we're already there anyway. Because yeah, I mean, we've got a case yeah, a case study going on right now yeah. after all the layoffs from COVID yeah. and people not wanting to return to work. Yeah. Um, so people are having a hard time filling positions. And so what they're doing is that they're offering – I mean – like I know uh, a kid who um, he's 19 or 20. Um, he's got a high school education. He started college, but he dropped out. Yeah. Um, he took an entry level position at a, uh, at a grocery store for like 15, $17 an hour, something like that. Like this is Sounds a no right. skill. Yeah. Well, like, and that's that's the point I was going to make is the minimum wage. And he wage. was like, screw college. I'm doing fine. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Well, and, and that's just it because the truth is, is so the minimum wage in Alabama is seven twenty five, I believe. Mm -hmm. I would challenge anybody to go find the job anywhere right now paying that. Yeah. Like you're not going to find that job. That that's job true. that job is paying twelve plus anywhere you go. Yeah. Um, and that's not what the minimum wage is. That's just we got to have people, and the it's just the the wage has moved up. Mm -hmm. So inflation yeah. has some effect on that too, though. Yeah, but, but it has some effect on inflation and well as well. There's yeah, like increased labor costs also increase the cost of the good, and yeah. that's one of the things that you always end up with uh, in the argument about with a, a leftist on minimum wage. And you say, look, if you increase the minimum wage by 20% or whatever, because a lot of these things are like roughly that. Yeah. You know, 12 to $15 an hour yeah. is a 25% increase in, yeah, from, in, the, in the wage. Yeah. Um, so uh, it, like if you increase the, the, uh, the price of wages by 20% across the board, yeah. then that's, all along the supply chain. Yeah. Um, that's production, transport, uh, the actual end user, et cetera. All of that stuff, labor goes up 20%. The cost of the good goes up more than 20% because yeah. you're paying that extra 20% all along the way the whole for way every of, single thing that happens. Exactly. Um, Each step in the process. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, you know, that that's, again, what part of the problem is that, like, now you haven't made... You haven't made things better for those people that got that raise. Yeah. Because they have 20% more money in their pocket, 
but everything costs twenty five percent more. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, and the idea that um, that these businesses will just absorb those costs well, is they wrong. Can't. Yeah, most of them run on very th- slim margins anyway. Exactly. Especially when you talk about grocery stores oh, and yeah. places like Retail, that, they're like two yeah. and three percent. Exactly. Um, they're really tiny margins anyway. They can't afford to absorb those costs. Yeah. That business won't exist at all. And yeah. just like the minimum wage thing, like it, it's better to pay. Um, eight dollars for a carton of eggs than to not get be able to get the carton of eggs. Yeah, like to not have access to a carton of eggs, and it's better to have a job for two dollars an hour than to have no job at all. Yeah, exactly. So, so um, yeah. So machines are good. Like all of these things increase productivity, which increases the wealth for the entire society. Yeah, like it's just more wealth creation. Absolutely. Um, now, the problem of it uh, being funneled into elites' pockets and not the average person, that's not a problem of economy. That's a problem of government. Yeah, absolutely. And we can go into that some other time, but I don't <laughs> feel like going down that rabbit hole right now. Well, I mean, we've talked one, about it one plenty. More, but one more thing on the, the prices going up, though. If you really want to fix prices going up, and particularly like inflation and stuff, a good thing mm-hmm. to do would be start lowering taxes. Because just like where you yeah. were talking about where the – and when you raise the labor in each link of the chain, the, uh, the price increases. The same thing with taxes. Mm-hmm. Like if you start reducing the taxes, you can – alleviate some of that price that you're paying at the grocery store or wherever. Yeah. And a lot of people love the idea of taxing businesses more. Yeah. But actually it's just a tax on everybody. It's a tax on the consumer. Absolutely. Um, Every tax on business is actually a tax on the consumer. It may sound good to you, but the person who ends up paying it in the end is the person that buys their product. They don't just absorb those taxes. They add it to their costs. Yep. Just the cost of doing business. Yep. Um, And, you know, like maybe another way that we can talk about government interference in this is with the Twitter file stuff, which I don't think that we talked about last week. I don't I don't think we did. I honestly don't remember. but I don't think we did. (laughs) Yeah. um, It it wasn't in our notes on the. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. It's not in my notes from last week. Those four lines of notes that I had from last week. (laughs) Don't don't include the Twitter (laughs) files. No. Um, So there's not honestly, there's not a whole lot to talk about from the Twitter files themselves. Um, it's what we suspected anyway, or, you know, I mean, we were confident that, that they were, um, they were getting their marching orders from the government. Yeah. Well, that's the thing to really talk about, but the, uh, you know, like the, the main crux of what people are talking about is that the, they were manipulating, um, the, I mean, they weren't even really manipulating the algorithms. They were just like choosing what to promote and what not to or what to hide. Yeah. Um, And they're never, especially at least as far as like we were concerned, like there was never really much of a doubt that that was going on. Right. I mean, you could pretty clearly see that there's there's something being manipulated here. Yeah. Um, the, the thing to be concerned about is that they, it, it's clear from the, this information that Taibi has been, Matt Taibi has been releasing, um, that the Twitter execs were having regular talks with representatives from U S intelligence. Yeah. I mean, like the, the thing about them, like taking orders from the Biden campaign, like he wasn't <laughs> even a president, um, yeah. to, uh, you know, like sub- subvert, information about that could be damaging to their campaign um, or that would help him uh, again, you know, to promote things that would help him against the, the, um, the incumbent president, the, the president that was in office, the sitting president at the time. Um, I mean, that's, (laughs) that's kind of amazing to begin with, but especially when you want to consider what we have went through the past four years before that, with the yeah. Russian collusion, like, like, how is this not the worse than the same thing? Like, yeah. Well, in, in Taibi, um, I heard in an interview, <laughs> he was saying that, that according to human sources, um, that they took censorship, that Twitter took censorship requests from conservatives, but the information that he's gone through so far, there's no evidence of that. Well, we never really, I mean, just being on social media during that time, I never seen any evidence of that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's like the FTX donations to conservatives, uh, like Sam Bankman Freed's supposed donations to conservatives. Yeah. Somehow those have, there's no record of. Yeah. 
Um, but he swears that they happened. But they and, happened, and, and yeah. so there's some people at Twitter that swear that, um, that they were taking uh, censorship orders from conservative offices as well. I'm but sure, the, I'm no sure they were taking that. the orders. They just weren't following through with them. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm sure they were listening to people complain, but yeah. that didn't mean they were doing anything. Right. Um, and I, I think the thing to focus on here is that the, the U S government has some real restrictions in terms of, um, in terms of censorship. Yeah. Like the first amendment is Exists. there for a reason. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's the first one. Yeah. For a reason. Right. <laughs> so um, the the U.S. government, we can't permit the U.S. government to work around the, the limits placed on it by the Constitution by using private companies to do it. Yeah. Um, and this, well, we'll come back to that. Uh, but that that's the real concern here. And I believe as much as any good, you know, anarchist libertarian... Um, that private companies should be able to discriminate on whatever basis they choose. Yeah. Like, but what you have is a situation. Th- this isn't a free market system. Yeah. That's kind of yeah. where, well, that's, down. and that was my whole problem from the beginning with this, especially with people who were like, well, you know, it's a private company. They can do what they want. Mm-hmm. Sure. I absolutely believe that, but it's a different story when you've got the government has an office in their headquarters telling them what they can and can't do. Like, yeah. like that's different than a free, than a true free market situation where the company decided this was the path they were going to take. Mm-hmm. Like this isn't the same thing. Yeah. And even beyond that, like leaving Twitter aside, just any business in this country, um, has to deal because the, the government has such power over the market in this country. Yeah. Um, that any business has to deal with the implicit threat that the government could shut them down at any time. Yep. For any reason. Pretty much. I mean, they'll have to provide like a, uh, like a legitimate reason, but it doesn't have to be it, actually yeah. legitimate. It well, just, it it yeah, just it has to sound good in front of the press. Yeah. Well, that and, you know, I mean, the on the off chance that they end up in court, but by mm-hmm. the time you end up in court, you've probably lost your business. Yeah, it's too so, late then. It's like, exactly. you, you know, when the IRS comes in and shuts you down, takes all your money, yeah. and then you prove that you shouldn't have, like that you did everything right. Properly. Well, yeah. it's too late. Yeah. Like, You've already lost your business. Yeah, you so. only you only get a portion of your money back, and your business is gone. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, and I, I did want to point out. I was thinking about this the other night when we went out, and um, you were asking me about cyberpunk. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, because like one of the premises of, or like one of the, it's not a premise necessarily, but one of the common features of cyberpunk stories is that the corporations are now in control. Yeah. Corporations rule. And I, I've always made the case that this will never happen. Yeah. This can never happen. And this is why, like, this is an example of why, yeah. um, what we were just talking about, the government has such a control over the market that there's always the implicit threat that they can end your business at any time. And this is why the corporations will never actually have the power over the government. Yeah. Because the corporations can't, I mean, they can put money here and there and they can line the right pockets and so forth. But when it comes down to it, in the end, the person that is in the government office always has more power. Yeah. Because if they're not happy with whatever the corporation wants them to do or or with the money that they're getting from the corporation or whatever, yeah. they can end that business. That business has a much harder time ending that government that government officer. It's kind of like the the old mob thing. Like mm-hmm. the, there's a reason the mob is in charge. It's because at the end of the day they got the force. Yeah. Um. Yeah. That's the reason that that you pay your your taxes to the mob because they've got the guns. Exactly. And it's the same way with the government. They've got the guns. Mm-hmm. Like at the end of the day, like you're not going to overtake them. Yeah. And that's the other aspect of it. Like besides them just having the the power of the courts on their side. Yeah. Um, they also have the military on their side. And you can say that a, you know, a corporation has the ability to raise its own army. This is true, but armies cost a lot. Yeah. And the only way that you can really maintain an army yeah. is if you can steal what you need to pay them right. or print it or <laughs> yeah. borrow it, which is have access to unlimited funds. Yeah. Um, the only, yeah. The only reason that the government can maintain these wars for as long as they have is because they can, they can print and steal the money that they need. 
Yep. And these are just two forms of the same thing as far as I'm concerned. You know, yeah. printing money creates inflation. It's the hidden tax. Yeah. Um, but they can force you to give them more money. Yeah. And a, a corporation always has to be able to, to inc incite's not the right word, but um, to get you to purchase their product. Yeah. In order for them to get money out of you, they have to provide you something that you want yeah. and that you're willing to part with you, money to get. You have to voluntarily give them money. Yeah. Your relationships with businesses are voluntary, except when government requires it, like yeah. buying insurance or whatever it happens to be, yeah. um, which is the best thing that can ever happen for a corporation. But oh, you, yeah. you still have the problem. I mean, look at the, uh, you know, look at the Lehman Brothers issue. Like yeah. government benefited um, those big banks to, and continues to, to yeah. a tremendous degree. But, you know, they let Lehman Brothers go. Yeah. They could have stopped it like they did with the other banks, but yeah. they didn't. Yeah. I mean, somebody didn't <laughs> pay the right people or, the right or, folks. or yeah. made a, the wrong enemy or whatever. Yeah. Anyway, so th those are the two reasons that corporations will never take over the world. They can't yeah. afford armies because they can't steal what they need to to pay them. Yeah. Um, they don't have the monopoly on force that government has. And in the end, and for the same reason, essentially, the government is always the one with the power. The government officer always has the power. So I shouldn't be worried about the McDonald's army coming? I don't think so. Okay. I don't think That's so. good to know. <laughs> yeah. Because, um, you know, I haven't eaten there in years. And I would hate to be forced to. <laughs> right. <laughs> I can't, my, my stomach can't handle that stuff. Uh, um, now, I only had one more uh, thing to talk about. And this is kind of, I mean, it's not exactly new on my radar. I think we mentioned it about a month ago um, that the U.S. was uh, pushing the U.N. Um, with a resolution to send an armed force into, Mex or into Haiti. Mexico is the other um, sponsor of the resolution to send uh, military force into Haiti to regain or, or to ensure security. Okay. I believe that that that's the, that's the official language. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't know. I like, this is kind of going to be part one of this because I, I have time to like really dig into this like I want to, but I do want people to, to know what's going on in Haiti or what's been going on in Haiti. Um, and why we might need to be a little concerned about it. Yeah. Um, so the reason that we need to be a little concerned about it is because the U.S. is pushing to get a uh, military force into Haiti. Now, they say they don't want to do it themselves. They want to send a third country to go, and they've been pushing Canada, but Canada doesn't really want to do it either. <laughs> I don't just, for some reason, I just don't picture the Canadian Army like <laughs> on the streets of Haiti. It just The Canadian Army is pretty capable, and they do often take marching orders from the U.S. I don't doubt any of those things. It just seems so, odd to me. Canada has been everywhere that we've been over the last 25 years. Uh, I don't so, doubt it. Um, but, uh, I mean, I guess what I'd like to do now is just, like, provide a little history. Okay. Um, and I, I had to take a lot of notes on this because I know a lot of this stuff and I can't, I can't keep it all in my head that easily. So um, I, I try. I'm pretty good, but yeah. not... Hole in your head getting bigger. Yeah, it definitely is. Like, <laughs> brain's working more like a sieve than it ever has before. <laughs> yeah. um, so, you may remember that about a year and a half ago, um, the prime minister of Haiti was assassinated. Um, that was uh, Jovenel Moise. Okay. Um, I think we mentioned it briefly on the podcast, but... Anyway, so there were there were already problems. There's always been problems in Haiti. Okay, like the there's been a lot of intervention in Haiti in the past, and they just even after all the work the Clinton organization has done down there, they, I know, they still haven't fixed this problem. It's hard to believe. <laughs> and um, you know, don't forget that the UN was there from 2004 to 2017. <laughs> really? Yeah. Um, and yeah, we somehow we haven't managed to fix the problem. Actually, I got a really good quote about that that time oh, nice. um, that the UN was there from 20, uh, 2004 to 2017. And that, like the thing I remember and any of our listeners that also listen to the no agenda show will be familiar with the, um, you know, uh, don't send them blankets, just send cash, <laughs> just send cash. Yeah. Yeah. That was, uh, that was 
GW. Uh, yep, old um, Bush. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Just send you cash. Yeah. <laughs> So I, actually, I think that was during the Obama administration. I think it was after that earthquake in 2010. Was it? Um, but I, I don't remember for certain. Yeah. Um, anyway, so the uh, after the prime minister, uh, Jovenel Moise, was assassinated, um, there was a group of countries, um, and this was July 2021 that he was assassinated. Now, um, this guy took over, Claude Joseph. He was the interim, like officially, the interim prime minister. Um, but a group of countries led by the U.S. released a statement saying, quote, designated Prime Minister Ariel Henry to continue the mission entrusted to him to form such a government. All right. So they completely ignored that the actual interim prime minister was this guy, Claude Joseph. Yeah. And um, I mean, it wasn't without reason that they that they uh, designated that they called him the designated prime minister. Ariel Henry. That's the guy who's still prime minister today. Okay. Um, he's never been elected, by the way. Oh, yeah. Uh, now, the reason that they use the that term is that he, presumably he was designated. Now, I, as far as I can tell, there's no record of this. Um, but presumably he was designated uh, not long before Moise's assassination by Moise to be the, the next prime minister. Oh, yeah. Um, but it was never made official. <laughs> but anyway, the the U.S. Um, the U.S. and a, a coalition of the usual suspects: yeah. um, Canada, Australia, the European Union, etc. Coalition of the willing. Right. Um, you know the same like twenty percent of nations on this earth that that dominate politics all over. Yeah. Um, also supported this guy, uh, Henri. Yeah. Now. I would, I think it would be remiss of me not to point out that this guy, Henri, later on, was linked to the assassination organizer, ah. um, including calls and visits with, uh, like visits to his home, to Henri's residence, um, by this assassination organizer after the assassination. Oh, wow. All right. Like, there's good reason to believe that Henri was part of the plot to to kill Moise hmm. anyway. Yeah. All right. Um, there's also reason to believe that the U.S. was somehow involved as well. They're, like, there's some connections there. But I haven't had time to, like, really dig into this. So yeah. um, we'll ignore that part. But we at least have pretty good evidence that the... the, the um, the standing prime minister was part of the assassination plot to kill the previous <laughs> prime minister. All right. Yeah. Um, and he's supported by the U S hmm. so I think it was like roughly September, um, of this year, uh, Henri, this is, this is like, there was all already unrest after the assassination, of course, and like yeah. all these, and they had, um, not had elections in a while. So a bunch of the, uh, Senate's terms had expired and they hadn't been replaced and like, like the government was kind so, of crumbling. So anyway. things are collapsing. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, so in roughly September of this year, um, Henri, uh, ended, uh, fuel subsidies. Um, by the way, at the behest of the IMF, which is also one of those like really corrupt su supranational <laughs> organizations yeah. that the U.S. more or less controls. And I suspect that the, the, the International Monetary Fund um, offered him some, you know, nice loans if he would end these subsidies and so forth. Uh, the people in the streets right now um, say that he ended the subsidies to punish them. Yeah. Who really? Uh, it could be both. I yeah. mean, <laughs> you don't know. Yeah. A little from column A, a little from column B. Hard to say. Um, but anyway, he ended the subsidies, and uh, it drove prices up by more than double. Really? Like almost overnight. Wow. Um, prices went up 128 percent in the next few days, or something like that. Um, gas right now there is like thirty dollars a gallon, Oof. or something. And this is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. Yeah. Like. Essentially, that puts fuel out of, uh, like... People can't buy it. Yeah. yeah. Most of the country cannot buy fuel anymore. So, now, um, there was a... Okay, so they had a fuel depot in Port-au-Prince, um, which is the capital there, um, 
that had been blockaded by this guy, uh, Jimmy Barbecue. That's his nickname. <laughs> Jimmy Barbecue Cherisier or something like that. I, right. That's I mean, it's Man, French, I want a, I want a nickname so. like that. Yeah. <laughs> well, and and so he was blamed for a massacre that there's no evidence happened at all. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. That's not where his barbecue name came from. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I think that might be. I'm not sure. <laughs> like, I mean, okay. So to and to be fair, like this guy, you see him, you listen to him. Like he's clearly lo- like a warlord type. Okay. Um. I mean, yeah. he he runs a, a neighborhood gang, yeah. um, but there's a bunch of these like neighborhood. I mean, that's kind of how I, I, my guess is that's kind of how things operate there. I mean, third world world country, you know. Yeah, um, but this guy uh, Cherizier, he he leads the FRG nine, okay. um, which they often just call G nine. So we'll the stick G, with that. The G nines. The G nines. Um, so he leads this gang or protesters or rebels or whatever you want to call them. <laughs> yeah. Um, and they blockaded this major fuel terminal in Port-au-Prince. And um, now Cherizier was claiming that they blockaded the fuel portal because, well, the government says, you know, they were uh, distributing fuel to the, you know, to the population so that everybody could, you know, get some help and get back on their feet. Sure. Cherizier is claiming that the fuel was only distributed to the elites anyway um, so he was, his claim is that they were blockading the port to try and hurt the elites that were taking advantage of them to he's, begin with. So he's, he's trying to be the Robin Hood character. Yes. No. Um, I mean, I don't, you don't know. know. Yeah. I, like yeah. <laughs> I, I, I can't tell at this point, I don't have enough information. Yeah. And, and let me point out that I'm relying almost exclusively on, uh, on two reporters on this. Cause there's just not a lot of information. Yeah. Um, U S news and world report put out a couple of things on it. Yeah. Um, but mostly I have been, and I, I read their articles too, but, um, mostly I'm relying on Dan Cohen who, uh, he was the, the co-producer of the killing Gaza documentary. He and Max Blumenthal did the killing Gaza documentary. Um, which if you haven't seen, I recommend, yeah. uh, it's, it's really fascinating and kind of horrifying, but it really fascinating. It's worth seeing. Um, but he went down there, he's got a video on YouTube, uh, that's about a half hour long, um, that includes, uh, quite a bit of interview footage with this guy, Cherizier. Okay. Um, and then a lot of, uh, footage of just like the situation in the slums really of yeah. Haiti, which is also horrifying. Yeah. I mean, like these people are living in lakes of sewage and it's just, just, just the worst conditions yeah. imaginable. Yeah. Uh, and they have this huge cholera issue, um, which most people are claiming is, uh, like the U S mainstream media is attributing to this fuel blockade, um, you know, creating all kinds of problems, including this cholera epidemic. Now this cholera epidemic has existed since like 2014. It's yeah. not new. <laughs> this yeah. is not, I mean, it may have gotten worse since the unrest, and the fall of the previous government and so forth. But, um, it's not something that he's the cause of. Yeah. And then they're also claiming that he, you know, because of his fuel blockade, that they're shutting down hospitals. Uh, but there's an interview in that Dan Cohen piece, um, with a, uh, a, uh, a hospital administrator near them that mm-hmm. says that, well, the, that they started having fuel issues and having to, um, yeah, like limitations on the amount of fuel that they could use, uh, starting in August, which was before even the, the assassination. Um, well, it was before even the price hike. Oh, the price hike. I got you. Yeah. yeah. yeah no, yeah. it was after the assassination. Okay. The assassination was last year. It was oh, like that's a year right. and a half okay. ago. Yeah. So, but like four months ago, they were already having problems with Getting fuel. fuel. Gotcha. So, um, it's, it's not, it's not because of the price hike and it's definitely not because of the blockade that they're yeah. having problems now. Um, so like, anyway, my point, I guess there is that this guy, Charizia, um, he's being made out to be the bad guy. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not convinced that he is. Yeah. And he seemed actually like very reasonable. I mean, you know, it's an interview. He's got control of the situation, like the information that he releases yeah. and so forth. But, um, you know, he's walking through this neighborhood. Like he points out at the beginning, like he's walking through this neighborhood, um, where he supposedly orchestrated a massacre of people. 
Yeah. And he's walking through without bodyguards and he's like greeting and interacting with people as he goes yeah. along. People aren't like trying to attack him yeah. or holler things at him or. Exactly. You know, yeah. It's not a hostile environment for him. Precisely. Yeah. Um, so, you know, and he, yeah. he says uh, now that that's information is pointed out by um, Dan Cohen and the, the journalist. Yeah. Um, but Cherizier says, like, I couldn't do this if I'd killed a bunch of people in this neighborhood. I wouldn't be safe here. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, well, then again, it, you could have the fear. Like, It they, could be the fear factor. Yeah. But at the same time, generally speaking, <clears throat> I, I would imagine, like I said, I haven't lived in those conditions. But I got to think that, you know, he, it, on some level at least, he wants what's best for the area he lives in because... He loves there. Yeah. Well, <laughs> what know? he says repeatedly uh, during this interview um, is that he what he what they're demanding from the government yeah. is potable water, housing, quality education, and security. Sounds like an activist to me. Yeah. Like I mean, that's I mean I, that's what I would expect a good activist to advocate for. Yeah, he, he sounds like a civil rights activist. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and like their conditions are terrible. Yeah. Like it sounds like those are things they need. Like when those are, when those are the complaints, mm -hmm. <laughs> like now, you kind of need those. Uh, of course, you know, my position is that like, if you're reliant on government for all these things, you've already lost, like you've already failed. Yeah. Like, you can't rely on government for all this stuff, but, but, you, but I understand the, the motivation. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. if the government's going to exist, it should at least provide the most basic of needs for its people. Yeah. Like, and, I'm not that I'm a big advocate of government, obviously, but, mm -hmm. I mean, that is the basic tenet of having a government. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this guy, Ariel Henry, who was never elected, who the U.S. is backing here, yeah. um, he is not popular in Haiti. Yeah. You don't like, think he period. could walk around like that? I don't think that he could. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think that he could. He is yeah. not popular there. Um, there's been a bunch of demands for him to resign. You know, uh, he and Cherizier also says like he has had the opportunity, like they've had opportunities to try and help the people of Haiti and his government hasn't done it. Yeah. No. Yeah. They've helped themselves. No. Yeah. And of course there's like a whole bunch of U S involvement here anyway. Um, like there's definitely an idea that, uh, the U S government is trying to keep the people of Haiti poor, um, because, uh, you know, uh, cheap labor has been outsourced to such a degree. And we, you know, if we become really hostile with China, then we don't have access to cheap labor anymore. Yeah. And that maybe this is the place to have cheap labor yeah. is if we can keep people poor in Haiti, we can at least get cheap labor over here. Um, there, uh, I, I'm pretty sure it was the Obama government. Cause I think it was Hillary Clinton. Like, like I said, I haven't had as much time to look into this as I'd like, but, um, but I think it was Hillary Clinton as secretary of state. Um, there were some labor reforms um, that were going on in Haiti back then. And I don't know, when when would that have been? 2010 to 2012, somewhere in there? Yeah. Um, and uh, and they, the U.S. government with um, Hillary Clinton as Secretary of State advocate like, quashed it, yeah. essentially. Like, you can't change these labor laws and make conditions better for your labor down there. Like, no minimum wages. No, you know. <laughs> yeah. Et cetera. And while I'm I'm opposed to minimum wages, like, the fact that the um, the left, you know, the liberal Democrat <laughs> the, the people government, who are, like, like, hollering for those things in our country or hollering against them in another country yeah. seems a little odd. Yeah. So, uh, and then, of course, like, going back to the... Um, all right, going back to the intervention issue, uh, every time the U.S. has advocated for intervention on with some reason, okay, uh, the president was assassinated. The you know it's chaos down there. Okay, well it's not chaos anymore. All right, well um, then in that case, uh, there's a real humanitarian crisis down there. We got to go down there for that. Um, okay, well that's been not entirely resolved, but we're not approving. Uh, military intervention for that. Okay, well, yeah. um, now we got to have a military invention so that we can break this blockade on this fuel port. Okay, well, that's been resolved. Well, you know, I, I think we still need a military intervention to ensure security. Like, so yeah. everything that's happened through this, like the U.S. There's, keeps advocating for a military intervention in this country. Yeah. We don't want it. No. <laughs> and they really don't want it. 
Yeah. Like Haiti has had enough of uh, military intervention. <laughs> interventions. Yeah. Um, so I, I found this quote uh, from um, Jonathan Katz, uh, who's a journalist about the UN intervention between 2004 and 2017. And we can kind of end on this cause we're pushing close to an hour already. Yeah. Um, but I, I found this, <laughs> I found this really insightful. Um, so he said, he wrote, I should say, um, quote, having sought above all to prevent riots, ensure stability and prevent disease. The responders helped spark the first undermine the second and by all evidence caused the third. Wow. Yeah. Um, because the, the cholera outbreak was actually traced to the UN intervention. Really? Yeah. Um, wow. And, uh, and of course, you know, the, they sparked riots just by being there and they undermined stability by sparking the riot. I mean, yeah. but I, uh, there's an <laughs> argument there. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm, I'm going to read that again, uh, just because I find this to actually pretty adequately describe almost all of our interventions. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so, um, having sought above all to prevent riots, ensure stability and prevent disease, the responders helped spark the first undermine the second and by all evidence cause the third. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's about our playbook, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I expect a second part of this when I've had more time to like kind of dig into more of the details. Yeah. Um, but I think that we should be aware of this because it's not getting any coverage. Yeah. And I mean, this is all news to me. Like, I mean, I've heard of very little of what you talked about tonight. Mm -hmm. Um, it's being handled through the UN, but clearly the U S wants to have a military presence in Haiti. Yeah. And, um, I mean, we've got they, military got, presences in enough places. Yeah. Well, and that, too many, <laughs> I was fixed to say, I mean, it, there's, there's something they want to get out of that. If they're wanting to invest our military down there, like there's, there's somebody has an end game there somewhere. Yeah. Well, um, it's rich in resources and poor in people. Yeah. Oh, good enough. <laughs> mm. Make it the 51st state. <laughs> Before Puerto Rico, they'd be thrilled about that. <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> um, all right. Well, uh, that's all I have for this evening. You got, you got no, anything? I'm, I'm good, man. Okay. Um, I don't know what the plan is for next week. Ooh. Week End of the week Christmas. is coming in on Christmas. Yeah. Um, I, so, um, I'm going to be seeing GI Greg, who's done a Christmas, Christmas episode, episode before. Yeah. Um, so I'll take all the stuff down cause I actually, no, I'm not any closer to you in Gulf Shores, am I? Mm, maybe. I don't know. Gulf Shores is that. I don't know. It's, it's closer to here than, well, I don't know what you mean. No, I mean like where you live. Like it, yeah. you're closer to me here than you are to yeah, me in oh Gulf yeah, Shores. Than yeah. In Gulf Shores. Right. Yeah, I well, am. Yeah. It was definitely quicker for me to get to Daphne than it is Gulf Shores. But I mean, I don't mind driving down there though. Okay. Well, we'll see about the timing. Um, should get an episode of some type out next week. Yeah. I'm, I may not have my follow up to the uh, to the Haiti, Haiti thing. Yeah. Um, at that point, but we'll we'll see. Um, we'll see. I mean, be I interested can, uh, to get GI Greg's perspective on the Haiti situation. Yeah, uh, mostly I want to find out why it is that we weren't able to convince him that U.S. intervention <laughs> is bad for the people that they're trying to okay. quote unquote protect. I would like to believe we <laughs> laid the groundwork for that. <laughs> okay, fair enough. <laughs> we, so. Why didn't we? Know? I don't know. Anyway, um, so uh, yeah, we'll we'll be back scene though uh, we we expect to get an episode out next week of one type or another yeah. um it is christmas week it's christmas so. week so it'll be it's gonna be, it'll definitely be a long week for me so. yeah new year's is easier yeah yeah i don't really do new year's anymore that's a uh, I'm, that's I'm, a young man's been, game i was fixing to say yeah i'm an old man now <laughs> well old men don't really do new year's man i remember um so my friends from high school and i we used to get together for new year's every year uh, here, actually close to here, down um, on the bay in Fairhope. Yeah. And, uh, I, like, I remember as we got older how it changed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, so, you know, for years, like, we we were up all night partying, watch the sun come up, yeah. and, then, and then go to bed. And then it was like, you know, we'd celebrate the new year, yeah. and we'd be going to bed at, like, three. Yeah. 
And then it was like, we were trying to stay up till the new year. <laughs> yeah, we can't quite even make it to the new year, yeah. right? Uh, and then it just yeah. fell apart altogether. <laughs> no, I, I definitely get that. So I don't know. I've never been, like New Year's is fine, but it, that was always kind of amateur night to me. Mm-hmm. Like I, I never was a big fan of like going out and partying hard on New Year's. Like I would always like go somewhere and that's where I would be. I didn't want to be on the roads yeah. in new, during New Year's just because it's, it's amateur night. People that don't normally party go out and party party yeah and you know it makes for a dangerous situation <laughs> we'll get gi greg's perspective on that since that's his anniversary <laughs> <laughs> it is his anniversary that's yeah that is a very good person that <laughs> that's funny all right well um we'll wrap it up there then uh so yeah we expect to get an episode out next week if not then definitely the week after um but we'll do our best to get something out next week and uh yeah in the meantime you can follow us on facebook subscribe on itunes youtube and or Podbean, um, like and share and tell your friends and comment and leave reviews and all of those other things that help us out. The main one, I, I think, like the what I like to try and promote to people is just tell your friends. Yeah, word of mouth. Yeah, man, this is this is the way to go. You like this podcast, you know somebody that you think would like it as well, or maybe would benefit from it. Maybe you want them to like it. Yeah. <laughs> Tell them about it. We're here for it. Yep. I would like to say that I'm willing to bet that Greg's reason for for having his wedding on New Year's mm-hmm. is taxes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You're probably right. <laughs> I'm just saying, it always comes back to that one. Yeah. <laughs> so I had a economics professor, but he was also a history professor. So, But his response would have been, was obvious. He was like, if you want to know about history... Yeah. Follow the money. Follow the money. Yep. yep. It'll tell the story clearer than anything you'll find. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, we'll be back uh, next time when we finally get this right. And in the meantime, try to stay free. Life short, live free. Ciao. Later. Mm-hmm.